like to thank you for joining us once again for another episode of Looking to Jesus. My name is John Hines. I'm the preacher for the Church of Christ in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I am joined by and Daniel Sanders, preacher for the Batesville or Quail Valley Church of Christ in Batesville, Arkansas. Have you gotten used to saying that yet? I have been, and actually this is the first time I mistakenly started off saying the Batesville, I was about to say the Batesville Church of Christ. Yeah. That's my first time doing it. I did it on camera. And on audio. <laughs> oh, that's all right. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing all right. How are you this morning? We're we're doing okay. Post post apocalypse of the eclipse. Yes, the apocalypse. The world did not end. Did you notice? I noticed. You know, I, I'm sitting there looking at all this, and you know, it's, you know, we got the saw a meme saying here was the uh, solar eclipse, how the sun was set up between you know the moon and then and then here's a lunar eclipse. And then the apocalypse was when the sun was between the moon and the <laughs> and the earth. And then there was also the alpaca lips. <laughs> nice. <laughs> the uh, but we survived. Lips. You know, uh, one of the one of the things that I, I, I was telling you earlier in the week was uh, when it went into totality here, because we were we were right in the line of totality here in Batesville. Yeah, was the temperature drop. In, yeah. instantaneously 15 15 degrees at least i mean you could just tell you know it's just it was a that was more remarkable to me than anything else uh, yeah, yeah. just seeing that just seeing it yeah, i mean it was like here it was 80 degrees i know i'm not supposed to be bragging about it but it was 80 degrees and all of a sudden next thing you know you could you could feel the chill in the air i mean you can brag about it if you want to but i've lived in arkansas and We'll, we'll talk when it's July and August. We'll talk here in a couple of months when I'm sitting here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When it's, when it's a hundred degrees in the shade and we'll talk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So we have been going through the churches of Asia in revelation chapter two and chapter three. Uh, we are ready for the third one mentioned today. We're ready to talk about Pergamos. We've spoken about the church in Ephesus. Last week, we talked about the church in Smyrna, and the church in Smyrna, they had they are not rebuked for, for anything that they've done. They are one of the right. congregations that had been faithful, had been working, and the Lord just encourages them to keep on. Yes. Um, and so it, it's a, uh, a church worthy of, of imitation. So that brings us now to church in Pergamos. Daniel, you want to read verse, uh, read the corresponding passage for us? Yeah. So that's Revelation chapter two, beginning of verse 12, looking down to verse 17. It says, and to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name. And did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have you you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone. And on the stone a new name is written, which no one knows except him who receives it. All right, there we go. So, one of the points we've made with the other uh, the other churches is the Lord has identified a certain way here, and yeah. there's a reason He's identified a certain way. So, here are the church in Pergamos, just so folks know where it is. 
it, it's the furthest north, at least as far as the congregations that are mentioned. Um, due north of Ephesus, it's actually inland a little bit. Ephesus is more on the sea, uh, has has a port, namely, and that comes into play in Pergamos's history. Uh, but Pergamos, a little, little further inland and due north. So then, which is which Smyrna kind of just also putting it in because we were talking about it last week. Smyrna is in between both Ephesus and Pergamos. Okay, so I, it's so like I'll just a little bit like a little due due east. Okay. I, I, Ephesus and Pergamos almost line up directly north south, and Smyrna is a little bit to the east or to the west. I'm sorry of uh, of Ephesus and, and gotcha. uh, Pergamos. Gotcha. So. So let let's talk about the sword business to begin with. Why do you think why do you think the Lord identifies himself this way? Well, I think one of the big things that's mentioned here is in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. That's immediately what I thought of. Was Hebrews 4 verse 12 yeah. where G uh, where, where the Hebrew author says the word of God is living and powerful, right. sharper than any two-edged sword which uh, pierces even to the division of soul and spirit joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, as we look here in our text in revelation chapter two, he also goes on to say the sharp two edged sword. Right. Uh, again, d- I think direct reference as well to what was also being described here. It's able to point out it's, it, it it's sharp, it, you know, and we've already seen this this figure before in chapter one, when the apostle John turns around and he sees he sees Jesus, and there in chapter one of verse sixteen, he had in his hand had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. So, we've already seen this figure, but yeah, I'm like you, I, I immediately think of of Hebrews chapter four. And the verse you you left off with verse twelve, verse thirteen. There's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes to whom of him to whom we must give account. It's like this is how the Lord knows our condition and um, how we how we react to the word, and we know what Pergamos is doing that they are they're compromised. Yeah, and um, as you have, you, you know, you have this picture of compromise. And it's like, what, what does the sword do? And it's like, it, it reveals it, it, you know, it opens you up all at no creature is hidden. All things are open. And I mean, it's just the power of the Lord. You know, I, I was thinking as, as you read it, cause the passage in revelation, the Lord says, repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And I don't know exactly what that means or how that was going to be done. But just spitballing here, like I said, this is not in any way conclusive. I believe most people think that the Apostle John was not going to die on the island of Patmos, if I remember correctly. That at some point, at a certain point, he is going to come back to the mainland and be... um, released from his exile. And I'll, I'll just say this. I, I would, I don't think Pergamos wanted the apostle John coming there. No. Um, but not to say that that's how it happened, but somehow the Lord, if they did not repent, the Lord says, I will come quickly and fight against them with sword of his sword of his mouth. And, and um, there's other, you know, there are other sword passages, um, you know, Jesus says, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Yep. We talked about the, the strife that was going to happen within, within the households. Right. And uh, you can uh, use Ephesians six the yeah, sword yeah, yeah. spirit, the offensive weapon that we are to take. And most folks make the point it, that it's both offensive and defensive. True. It's the, the two edged nature of it. Yeah. Um, that it, it cuts both ways anyway. I don't know if there's anything to that or not. I, I think the the Hebrews passage is the most, you know, clearly that it's it's sharp. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, uh, you know, one of the other things I think about with this is, uh, you know, 
you know, looking at jumping ahead there at verse 16, and we'll fight against him with the sword of my mouth. I mean, we're going to be judged according to the words that Jesus spoke, to the words that God, his God's son, Jesus spoke. You know, God gave Jesus all authority, all power and everything. Right. There he is. He's got, he's, he, he's showing all aspects of power, being a king, being able to show the wielding of power by sword. Uh, we're going to be judged by the, by what he says and what he has done. And we're going to either be confessed or we're going to be uh, condemned. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, if we reject him, we have the words that will judge us. Yeah. And that's, that's what it is. And, and so I was, you know, to just that idea of sharpness and that, you know, when you're, when you're cutting meat and you think about that, that figure in Hebrews, oh, how does it, how does it phrase it? Oh, I turned away from it for some silly reason. It's living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. Uh, folks like to make hay about that. And it's like, well, what's going on there with the separating between soul and spirit? The point is it's sharp. And that if and that the Lord can discern between the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And it's just it's that's that's what it is. And we know what the Lord uses. So what's going on? What's going on in Pergamos? Let's go on from the sword where you want to go next. Continue on into in into verse 13. I mean, just like he does with uh, the other two so far. And what we'll see uh, commonality is. Jesus knows, you know, right. one of the first, one of the first things that's said immediately after each of these, almost after each of these churches is I know your works. I know, yeah. you know, I know what's going on, you know, and he points out some, maybe some slight different details, but I believe the, if I look real quick, I'm just, I'm looking at all both chapters. Um, well, he doesn't say I, I stand corrected. He, he doesn't say the, oh, no, he does. And yeah, every, every one of them immediately, all seven churches, he begins off saying, I know. I know your work. So again, right. there's, this, there's this evidence of Jesus knowing what's going on with each individual church. Right. Uh, show, showing, showing the omnipotence of everything as well. I know, here we go. I know your works. I know that, you know, where you dwell. And, you know, the, the first thing, the first thing that is we were talking about right before we started was the Satan's throne. That's the first thing after he, after he says, I know your works, I know where you dwell. Yeah. And then goes on to say where Satan's throne is. Right. And um, we, we were talking beforehand, the, the question, the question comes up, well, what is, what does that mean? And why is it called Satan's throne? And we won't go into it too much. But there was a time, and I'm not sure if it was, it may have been at this time, but at a certain point, Pergamos was the capital of Asia. Rome had made Pergamos the capital of Asia. The city was filled with idolatry. Um, there were various temples. Some of the, uh, I was watching a video that uh, folks who are familiar with Farrell Jenkins and some of, some of the work that he's done. And um, those who, are, who have toured the ruins over there, that there, there's a hospital that is known of over there, you know, the ancient, an ancient hospital. And where if you even wanted to go to the doctor, which as we're recording this, like you just went to the doctor this morning. Um, if you went to this hospital in Pergamos, it was filled with idols. And the way that you were healed was you had to call they expected you to call on their foreign gods or on the emperor. And so the point being, wherever you turned in Pergamos, there is idolatry. It, it was yeah. just, it was filled with it. That's, that's what it was. And it's, it's interesting. Out, it's interesting seeing this. I didn't mean to cut you off, but it's interesting to see how this is in, in historical factor, how this is made known as being above measure with idolatry yet it seems like it's taking more precedent over what was going on at, uh, at, at Mars, Mars Hill, where they had idol worship for every religious factor. Right. And yet this one was even mentioned as being, you know, 
according to historical factor, this was mentioned even more of a nature. Yeah. And um sorry, just just no, that was run through my mind with that. No, you're I think, right. I think this 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 kind of shows if you can kind of put in perspective of what's going on there, Marshall, comparing it to this, this is above measure according to some some his, history with this. And um you know, you have the different regions uh, around the Mediterranean and then of course down in Israel. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it almost seems like each region had a, um, as they had their capitals and you had these, these hot points. So for example, when Paul's in Athens, well, that's, we're in Greece at that point where we are right now with Pergamos, we're in modern day Turkey. We're on the edge of modern day Turkey. Yeah. And so it was, you know, separated somewhat by the Mediterranean and the, um, oh, what's it called? The, uh, oh, the Aegean and things, things along those lines. But still, it's like each, it's like each region had its own hot point and it looks like Pergamos was this hot point. And um, <laughs> I, I guess idolatry shouldn't be a competition. No. <laughs> I don't know, but they're, they're in the running um, for sure. Uh, so anyway, it's like, that's, that's what it was. And yet there were those who held fast to the Lord's name, it says. Um, you hold fast to my name. You do. You did not deny my faith, even when the days in which Antipas uh, was my faithful martyr. What, what did you find on Antipas? Do you find anything, really? So uh, Antipas, again, now again, using uh, some of the historical stuff, was said that, you know, when you were, when you were mentioning just a moment ago, like there at the ho- with the hospital thing of, idolatry and then there had to be some sort of acknowledgement of different things right in order to receive treatment it was it, it said with antipas that he wouldn't recognize the caesar as lord right uh you know here was caesar was coming coming across wanting people to confess him as the lord as yep as the one in power and everything and he would not do those things he would not give in to those indulgences, not give in to the, to the peer pressures of everything and uh, was executed for such actions. We could make a comparison, and I'm not saying it's a direct comparison, but looking at what was going on with Stephen there in Acts chapter 7, uh, he was a faithful, we, 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 Antipas is recognized as a faithful right. martyr. Stephen also was a faithful martyr. We have a little bit of more evidence of what happens with him where he preaches and then the people were cut to the heart. They gnashed their teeth at him and then they threw their, their coats at Paul and then they stoned him to death. Yeah. And just as you mentioned that, like I said, the, you know, historians aren't real sure about Antipas, but there is, from what I saw about Pergamos, there's a pillar there with, and it's basically deifying the emperor. And that's what they expected you to do. Yeah. And um, it, it was a part of life in that city. And Antipas, whoever he was, whether he was an elder in the congregation, some folks think that, or whatever it was, he would not go along with that, and he was killed for it. Right. And that's where Satan dwells. And you had you had this, frankly, satanic influence, and that's that's what it was. Um, and then you get into verse 14. I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. So we're going to talk about two things. We have the doctrine of Balaam, and then we have the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And um, where you want to go with Balaam, Daniel? Um, well, for one thing, who was Balaam? What did he do? Um, and what's, what's the connection? Well, we see, you know, the, the, the false prophet and all the different things going on. And uh, I, have refer- I, have, I have a couple of different references. Um, man, you put me under the bus just like that. I thought you were going to kind of lead into it. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't throw you, I wouldn't throw you under the bus. I would put you on the spot, though. Uh, yeah, sure, um, sure. Concerning, let's see, it's, it's numbers. It's numbers 25 that I have a couple of different things. Numbers 25, one through five. I was starting off, I was starting off talking about the, 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 the doctrine of Balaam. They were eating things sacrificed to idols. Uh, yeah. 
You so know, Balaam, basically the account of Balaam goes from, what is it like? Numbers 22. And it almost seems to end in chapter 24, but it doesn't really. Right. <laughs> it, it doesn't really. So Balaam, you know, so you have, who's Balak? The king of Moab, isn't that king right? King of Moab, yep. Yeah. And um, so he wants to hire Balaam. So he wants to hire Balaam to come and curse God's people. Well, on the way, basically the Lord tells Balaam, you better not say anything that I don't tell you to say. And Balaam's plenty of afraid, plenty afraid. You have the account of Balaam's donkey and the angel of the Lord standing in front with a sword in his hand. But Balaam ends up blessing Israel. And just on the surface, it's like, well, that all seems good. And there, there are passages that talk about how the Lord turned, um, that the Lord would not permit him to curse Israel. But then when you finally get to chapter 25, it says, now Israel, verse one, now Israel remained in a Sasha grove and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifice of their gods and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. And so Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. And you can tell from other accounts that Balaam, it says Balaam taught Balak to do that. And that he could not, out of fear of God, and I'm not out of fear of, yeah, you just say out of fear of God. It wasn't the love of the Lord. That's for, that's for right. sure. Won the love of the Lord, but out of fear of God, he could not curse them. But there's different ways to skin a cat. And uh, he was not a fan of Israel. He was not a Jew, frankly. He wasn't a Jew, and he teaches Balak what they need to do. Namely, he appeals to their sensuality, right? And he... um and they begin to commit harlotry with the women. So when we come back up to Revelation 2, and it's, okay, I have a few things against you. You have there who hold there, those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to do this. Um, what's the problem with eating meat sacrificed to idols? Because that's something specifically that they're rebuked for. It's given honor. It's given preference uh, to, to to another god, to something other than God. Uh, they all they were making these different sacrifices to different things, so they were bowing down to worship those different foreign gods and idols and whatever it may have been. And that's where the problem is: is that they were giving that preference or that love uh, to over, over God. You know, no one can serve two masters. You're going to either be loyal to one and hate the other, and you're going to despise one, or you know whatever it may be. You can't serve God and man. You can't serve God in the world. As we look at this, this goes back to a principle that we were talking about in Matthew chapter six, verse twenty-four, in the Sermon on the Mount. And the, and you know, is there a problem with eating meat? No, it's not the eating of the meat. It's when you're sitting there and offering it. You know, to the sacrifice. This was going against what was being taught. The, you know, this is what they they did back in X fifteen with the Jewish Council of not to eat these different things, not to partake in these different things, not to engage and offer and believe in it and also kind of say, well, this is acceptable uh, to follow and practice false religion or to embrace foreign religion. Yeah. And you know, you can, the, the issue comes up. It's like, well, what's, what's the big deal. And um, you can tell they were having to be very careful about this. And you can tell from, there, there's more than one passage written about it, but that that passage that you referenced, you know, there in Acts 15, when, frankly, the apostles, along with elders there, they send out a letter basically saying, you are not, we are not going to command people to be circumcised. Yeah. And um, because that was the big question. But they do say says, therefore, this is verse 19, therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled and from blood. 
And so that goes out and that's, that's what they need to do. Another passage I wanted to read concerning this is first Corinthians chapter 10. And you have this warning against idolatry. And in verse first Corinthians 10 verse 14, therefore my beloved flee from idolatry. Verse 16, the cup of blessing, which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Uh, a little further in the account, let's see, verse verse 18. And this is the concept that that's going to come to light. Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What am I saying then? That an idol is anything or what is offered to idols is anything? Rather, the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons, or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? All of that speaks to what's going on in, in Pergamos because they're, they're compromising. And they're thinking that they can do both. That... Yes, or I should say, no, meat, meat doesn't mean anything. An idol's not anything. It's just a statue. But not everybody understands that. Yeah. And sometimes those who think they understand it, uh, they may not understand it like they should. And they needed to be very careful with the idol's and with the meat that was being sacrificed and burnt offerings to the idols was then being sold in the marketplace. And they needed to flee idolatry. And um, they needed to be very, very careful about it because all of this is, all of this is intertwined. Um, you look like you want to say something. I, well, I, I got a verse that I was also, I was looking it up because I was sitting there thinking about it when you were reading the stuff from first Corinthians and that's second Corinthians chapter six, verse 14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness. You know, the whole idea of everything is we're not to be yoked together. We're not to be joined together with such things or to, to give heat or precedent to right. such things as Christians. Uh, you know, we're not the, we're not the kind of, you know, I'm actually working on a lesson, but the idea of, uh, right now, no, not right <laughs> this second. Actually it's, it's for Sunday and it's talking about the church, but then, uh, we, it's a word that we don't use very much. I've heard it used in a couple of different, I've heard it used in a lesson before, and I didn't know what the word meant when I came in. And when I left here in the lesson, I didn't know what it was. And the word is ecumenicalism. Yeah. The support of the unity of being able to uh, each religious, you know, just having religious unity, every different sector that doesn't work. You can't compromise on this and yeah. Pergamus was allowing such things to infiltrate the church there. There were some that had not defiled themselves, but there was a lot of them there that were allowing different religious to be able to kind of be joined together and being able to compromise on these things. And well, we're going to turn the blind eye to it. God was angry when Israel chose to be able to embrace the, 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 uh, the, the offerings are, and the, uh, idol worship of Baal and all these and all worshiping of all the Baals and all the different things that were engaged, the idolatry, the harlotry, everything. He was displeased with it all. Yeah. And, and it all, it all starts going hand in hand. The second part was committing sexual immorality. Yeah. And, um, one, one of the things I, I wanted to mention, it, it's not spoken about specifically here, but you, you get into the, what, what's going on here and what leads to this? And, and we didn't really talk about this beforehand. We know in the first century, there was something called Gnosticism. Yes. And, and, and to just think about how do, you, how do you get to the point of thinking you can serve the Lord and serve idols? How, how can you get to the point of thinking you can be a Christian and commit sexual immorality? 
you know, how do you get to that point? And what the Gnostics held was that basically physical matter is evil. It's one of the, one of their core doctrines. Then just to give it, and I was oh, working on this for class. Um, they don't even, they didn't even believe that God created everything because the creation involves physical matter. Well, they thought physical matter was evil. So what they believed was that God sent out these in these emanations further and further and further away from himself, himself until finally there was an, an emanation that he sent out that was far enough away from him that that is then what created physical matter. And it, it was just a, a crazy doctrine, but, and we just don't have time to get into it too deeply, but what it led to was a skewed view of, they thought the spiritual, the spiritual was all that mattered and the physical did not matter. Now, what that led to was the spiritual was all that mattered and you could physically do whatever you wanted to do. And if that was commit fornication, who cares? It's just, it's just physical and physical doesn't matter. You want to eat meat sacrificed to idols. You want to go, you know, start worse. You know, that's just physical matter. It doesn't matter. And so it is called a doctrine. Yeah. You know, the, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, the doctrine of, of Balaam and where it was taught, it, whatever, whatever's going on here, it's being taught. And, and it's deceiving Christians. And I think you can see the same thing today, frankly. Um, yeah. That there are, there are a lot of folks still think physical doesn't really matter. Um, and I, <laughs> this is not a tangent when I say this. So don't take it as a tangent, Daniel. <laughs> Get on your soapbox. Go ahead. <laughs> but I know sometimes when you're in a discussion about tattoos, and people will say, well, God really doesn't care what I put on my body. And like I said, this isn't, we're not taking a tangent now and talking about tattoos, but I'll say this, God cares about everything. Um, <laughs> and that's just, that's just simple. God cares about everything. And so when people talk about their appearances, when people talk about what they do with their body, uh, our body is called temple of God. That's first Corinthians. I believe is it first Corinthians or second Corinthians. It talks first. about that. It's first, first Corinthians. Thank you. First Corinthians six or seven in there. Yeah. First Corinthians six. And, and I mean, you, you can see that same thing because that first Corinthians passage, it's don't think you can be joined to a harlot and it won't affect you. Like, no, you're sinning against your own body. And we're supposed to glorify God with our body. Gnosticism was a big thing. And when you start understanding that, and I'm not sure I understand it, you see this was something that the church was really having to deal with because they were saying what you do with your body does not matter. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, it matters. Anyway, sorry, soapbox, tangent. <laughs> well, not really a tangent. I think that's what's going on here. It's like, how do you get to the point? You know, what is this doctrine? Because they were not going around calling themselves Balaamites. No. But you look at what Balaam did, and he seduced. They seduced Israel, and they were committing harlotry. So, anyway, and 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 you know there were there were consequences for such actions when when this whole thing happened with Baal uh, with Balaam and everything, and Israel ga gave into their urges and followed and was playing the harlot with them. Uh, you know we read later on there in Numbers chapter thirty one. And verse 8, it says they killed the kings of Midian with the rest of those who were killed. Evi, Rechem, Zer, Her, Reba, the five kings of Midian. Balaam, the son of Beor, they also killed with the sword. Yep. Verse 16, look, these women caused the children of Israel through the council of Balaam to trespass against the Lord, the incident of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. There was, I mean, there was just 
there were consequences for engaging in such things, uh, and God was displeased with them. I mean, again, we're a stark reminder of how God felt about the whole issue with what Balaam had done and what Israel had engaged themselves with, with there were indeed consequences for such actions. Right. Hey, you know, what, one of the questions I have about the Balaam account, and um, what, one of the questions I have is, because it just says they committed harlotry. My question is about marrying unbelievers, and people have different views on that, about whether or not it is sinful. I think every most people agree it's not wise, um, but the question is whether or not it's it's sinful. And I've always wondered if, if part of that was not Balaam, because in the Old Testament, it was sinful. Um, that's pretty easily shown. Uh, when they come back from captivity and they've married pagan wives and they they have to put them away. So it was definitely sinful in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we know from Paul's letters to the Corinthians, there were those who had unbelieving spouses. And Paul specifically says, do not, do not put them away. <laughs> um, right. Do not, do not divorce them. But you know, that's in the same vicinity as the passage you mentioned a little bit ago about do not be unequally yoked. And um, folks better be real careful because the danger is what's happening in Pergamos. It's compromise. And you can just easily compromise the faith. And anyway, I, I wonder if that's not one of the things with Balaam's doctrine. Yeah. Yeah. Not just the harlotry, but it's, you know, thinking about being joined. And by the way, Corinthians uses that language. Whoever is joined to a harlot and you're joined to an unbeliever and um, uses that that sort of language. Anything else about Balaam before you talk about the Nicolaitans? No. No, well, I well, I do have also just Jude Le- Jude. Verse 11. What is that? Uh, this is the uh, woe to them. Yeah. Uh, for they've gone the way of Cain. They've run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit and perish in the rebellion of Korah. I mean, again, there's just some some references of some of the different things that were going on uh, about consequences. And Jude was reminding of these things. I've, I've actually talked more about it with some more verses here in just a little bit. But And, and I'll, I will say... I'm glad you brought that up because we probably ought to recognize why Balaam did what he did. Yeah. And he was doing it for profit. He was doing it for yeah. money. Right. And um, at that time in Asia Minor, uh, there were those who were turning away from the faith or compromising their faith for economic reasons. Yeah. And so don't, you know, we should not lose sight of the love of money is um, was a part of Balaam's story. All right, so now we go on to the Nicolaitans, and Nicolaitans came up, where did they come up? The church in Ephesus. Yeah, church in Ephesus, that because they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans, you read there in Revelation 2. Right, which the Lord says, I also hate the church in Pergamos. At least some of them, they don't hate those. They don't hate the Nicolaitans. They actually have some who are holding the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, uh, which the Lord once again says, I really hate that. <laughs> And um, all sorts of folks talk about who this is. Um, there's some speculation. W- would you say it's fair to say with both of these these things, we're we're simply dealing with idolatry and worldliness. That's a safe. That's a safe conclusion. I mean that that's you know a rose by any other name is still a rose. Yeah. What whatever you call it. This is what we're this is what we're dealing with, and like I said, I think um, I'm not sure it's too different. E- even though it's it's broken apart, you have those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, and you have those who hold the the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Does that mean that there were two different factions within the church, or in, or in reality, it's like we're talking about the same people? <laughs> yeah, I, you know. I, th- I would say that it would be a good conclusion of being able to say that, you know, come with the same people. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, the, like I said, there was, I was talking, uh, you know, looking at you go down the rabbit hole, so to speak, and uh, you can get into a whole bunch of things about 
who who speculate on what with it right of the D of the Nicolaitans and everything. One thing's for certain is is that it's some sort of doctrinal teaching. It's it's a false right. doctrinal teaching. We can come to that conclusion. Right. You no, know, and, and and thinking about this, Proverbs six, verse sixteen down to verse nineteen, Lord says he hates certain things. Seven are an abomination to him. Six things the Lord hates, seven are an abomination. He talks a couple of times, says, you know, a lying tongue, hard to devise wicked plans, feet that are swift and run to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, one who sows discord among the brethren. I mean, you know, you look at that, the, the false pretenses of everything. Again, God is jealous. He does not want right. us to fall down to worship any other thing. So, and it's evident here once again. We look at that in the Old Testament. When he gave the law, he pointed out then and pointed out several times, even prior and after, he does, he is jealous. He wants us to worship and follow him. We don't want to put anything above him. Don't want to put mammon above him as we look at the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6 24. You right. can't serve both. So God hates these things. And so obviously when we make this conclusion, the doctrine, the deeds of the Nicolaitans was something that was false and that what people were taking and putting it above God. We can make that conclusion for sure from what we, from our, from our observations here. There, there are, you know, I appreciate you bringing up that verse in Proverbs. People, people need to realize there are things that God hates. Yeah. And um, I had a sermon one time, someone else had preached a sermon and, and the, the title of that person's sermon was based on love. And certainly, you know, when God is love and he is a loving God and we could talk about grace and mercy and forgiveness and all these things. And I, that Sunday night, I preached a sermon called based on hate <laughs> and um, because God hates things. There, yeah. there are certain oh. things that God absolutely detests and false doctrine is one of those things. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 we read about him being just right you know i think that that that's what gets overlooked so many times in, in, in religious doctrine today is that god is just there are things that he loves and just like there are things that we love there are things that we hate god we should does, yeah god does hate certain things you know, we always want to preach about God being a God of love and everything. And yes, it is true. I am not going to deny it. But that love also comes with, well, there's some things that, you know, there's that there's that tough love as well that we could we can incorporate. And then there's things God God loves enough that he, he also hates certain things that draw us or turn us away from him. And this is one of the big ones of giving in to something else. Yeah, I can't help but think of what Peter says in Second Peter two. It would have been better for someone to have uh, not known the way than to know the way and turn away from it. Right. Here, this church in Pergamos is on that borderline, and what does Peter say about it? I wish you would have not known the way. Yeah, they they need to repent. Um, yeah. and, and again, the Lord is the Lord has the sharp two edged sword, the Word of God. And the reason the church was being compromised was because they were compromising the word. Exactly. They were compromising they were, God's word. Right. They were they had received the word and now they're receiving false doctrine. And they need a clean house. And um if those folks, if those false teachers did not repent, they needed to be withdrawn from, frankly, and um shown the door. Um Otherwise, the Lord was going to take more drastic measures, tail end there, verse 16, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth if they if they did not repent. Yeah. Um, well, I, mentioned second, I mentioned Second Peter 2, and I was mentioning verse 18 and verse 22. I want to also use verse 15 because, again, it's referencing back to what, you know, the Nicolaitans and, and Balaam and everything. It says they have forsaken the right way and gone astray. This is talking about people that have given into false doctrine, into right. false practices. It's the very next thing there in verse 15 says, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor. Right. And what, what was, Balaam was involved with these things, teaching falsely and causing God's people to give way, to give precedent to those different false teachings. And it says, 
he loved the way of unrighteousness. Yeah. You know what gets me, Daniel? You read the account earlier where Balaam is killed. Yeah. And it's like you would think if the Lord speaks to you and you see the angel of the Lord while you're on your donkey, you know, beating the fire out of it. <laughs> and you would think at some point, why don't you try joining Israel? Why don't you become a proselyte and become a follower of Jehovah? He doesn't do that. No. He, he's still stubbornness. He's in Moab. And, and my point is, and God judges him and he's and killed. God, and he's and killed shows all his the others. Fairness. He gave him so many different opportunities and yeah. used that donkey to be able to try to get, you know, get some sense into him. And he's still, he, he's still trying to find, he's trying to find a workaround. Yeah. And he finds it in a sense, and they seduce Israel. Um, and Israel, by the way, is held accountable for that, for falling for the lies, right. or, or for falling for that tactic, I should say. Um, but Balaam's held accountable too. And these folks here in Revelation 2, and it's they're going to be held accountable. The Lord knows where we started. The Lord yeah. knows. He knows what they've done, and he knows whether or not they're – he knows – Hopefully they repent. If they repent, the Lord will know that too. Exactly. If they did I, not repent, the Lord would know that as well. I mean, I mentioned, you know, there in Jude verse 11, uh, it talks about those who have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit. Right. This is where it comes into play about this, the, the two edged sword verse, verse 15 of Jude, it says is execute judgment on all to right. convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds that they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. You know, yeah. I'll just read the, the, the end part. That's verse 15. You can read verse 11 down to verse 15 to kind of see the, the gist of it all. But here, again, it's a recall reminder of what happened with Balaam and the thing, same thing's going to happen for us. The same thing's going to happen for that church in Pergamos. God's going to execute judgment on all. You know, he is the executor of all things. He's going, we're going to be judged. And those who are, you know, found, who are convicted and found guilty are going to be punished in the end of those of things that they have not repented of. Yeah. You, you know, to tie it in with what we spoke about last week with Smyrna, Smyrna could easily have gone down the same road. You, you know, like I said, it's yes. Ephesus, Smyrna, moving northward, Pergamos. And that Ephesus had done a lot of good but they'd left their first love. But then you have Smyrna and Smyrna's just, they're doing what they need to do. They easily could have gone the same way as Pergamos and compromised. It's like, they're not going to do it. Pergamos, they're compromising. Verse 17, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. It's not just for Pergamos. Right. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat and I will give him a white stone and on the stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Uh, whenever I think about the man, I think about, is it John 6? Yeah, John 6, where the Lord talks about the manna, and then he says, I am the true bread from, he from heaven. Yeah. And it's the Lord who sustains. And um, to look at that that figure, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and it's Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The same word from the sword, from that two-edged sword. Exactly. Yep. And so uh, you, you want to say anything about the new name on the stone? I, I really didn't have any notes on that. I didn't. I and didn't and really, I'm, I, didn't, I uh, didn't really have much as well. I mean, you know, I just, you know, I, I it, I'll, I'll say this, it kind of ends the same way, you know, what we've already spoken about. No one knows except him who receives it. We're back to knowing again. And by the way, that may go to that, the Gnostics. And I would encourage our listeners, do some research on the Gnostics and um, what they believed. They believed that they believed they had special knowledge from God. And the word Gnostic is based on the word knowing yeah. No. And so sometimes, especially going through John's writings, for example, John 1, verse 1, 
or, or John one there in the first chapter. Um, Oh, how does it phrase it? I'm doing class, Daniel. <laughs> doing, getting ready to, to start the adult class. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. Mm-hmm. And first John chapter one, by this, we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments all through revelation, like he said, in every church, I know the Gnostics thought they knew. And the Lord says, no, he who overcomes, I'm going to give him a stone and on the stone, a new name, which no one knows except him who receives it. And I think it probably just speaks to that personal relationship with the Lord. That it's you follow the Lord. You don't follow, you don't follow the idolatry. You don't follow the sexual immorality. You follow the Lord and you may be completely excluded from society but this is about me and you, the Lord yeah. and the disciple. So anything else you wanted to add? No. What are we talking about next week? Where, talking where are we about going? corruption next week with Thyatira? All right. Jezebel. Yes. Not, I not agree. too many parents name their daughters Jezebel anymore. <laughs> no, but there, but there, but there are mothers who call their, who are dating their sons, a Jezebel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's probably fair. Anyway, so we'll talk about that next week. So we'll go and wrap up there. Appreciate the study, Daniel. Yes, thank you. Appreciate it as well. Yeah, and appreciate everyone joining us. Hope everyone is doing well. Uh, hope you tune in next week. Join us for another episode of Looking to Jesus. Thank you. Looking to Jesus.